Well, I, I uh, wrote about 10 icons of evolution in my book. I could have written about more, but I had to stop somewhere. And the 10 that I wrote about uh, were, first of all, the 1953 Miller-Urey experiment that purported to show that uh, life could have begun spontaneously on the early Earth. And this is still found in most biology textbooks, even though geochemists decades ago decided that the experiment was unrealistic and really doesn't say anything substantial about the origin of life. The second icon was Darwin's tree of life, the branching pattern uh, that would show how all organisms descended from a common ancestor at the root. Uh, and this is a, a theoretical statement, but it's presented in most biology textbooks as, a, textbooks as though it were a fact. The fossil evidence, for example, does not show this branching tree pattern. When you look at the different major groups of animals, they appear pretty much at the same time, rather than diverging from a common ancestor. The third icon I wrote about was homology in vertebrate limbs. If you look at the bone structure of the human hand or the human arm, you compare that to a whale's flipper or a bird's wing or a bat's wing, there are certain striking similarities in the bone structure. And Darwin considered this uh, to be a result of common descent. But people before Darwin had noticed the same thing, and they called it, uh, they attributed it to a common designer. Well, the truth is, it could be either one. The bone structure itself doesn't tell us. The fourth icon is Heckel's embryo drawings, uh, which purport to show that vertebrates are very similar as early embryos, and therefore, this provides evidence for common ancestry. But in fact, the embryos are not similar, and Heckel faked the drawings. Uh, the fifth icon, that I wrote about was Archaeopteryx, a famous fossil of a, an ancient bird that had a long tail and teeth in its beak like reptiles, and for a long time was thought to be the missing link between reptiles and birds. Uh, biologists no longer think that because there are too many differences between Archaeopteryx and modern birds, but textbooks tend to present it as the missing link anyway. The peppered moth is a famous icon of evolution uh, in which uh, Moths supposedly changed color during the Industrial Revolution because uh, they were dark moths were better camouflaged on soot darkened tree trunks and the birds couldn't see them and so they ate the light moths and left the dark ones. And uh, this is still used in many textbooks as a, a classic example of natural selection in action when in fact biologists discovered in the 1980s that peppered moths don't rest on tree trunks in the wild at all or normally. And so uh, the textbook pictures have all been staged and the story has serious flaws. Darwin's finches, another icon of evolution, are uh, 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 some species of birds on the Galapagos Islands that are very similar except for the size and shape of their beaks. And it's thought, and it's quite possible, that they evolved from a common ancestor because of uh, having to eat different foods on the different islands. But the actual evidence uh, shows us only that the beaks can change uh, over a matter of years uh, based on climate and diet, but the changes are temporary, they oscillate back and forth, and they don't go anywhere. So as evidence for the origin of species, Darwin's finches uh, really don't work. Uh, another icon of evolution is the four-winged fruit fly. Most fruit flies have two wings, but a series of mutations in a fruit fly can cause it to develop a second set of wings, very normal looking, but in fact there are no muscles attached to it, so the second set of wings is effectively dead. Uh, the fly is a hopeless cripple. It's kind of like having a small plane with an extra pair of wings tied to its tail. Uh, this is not uh, uh, the forerunner of a new race of insects, but an evolutionary dead end. The last two icons I wrote about were fossil horses and the ape to human uh, picture. Uh, in both cases, uh, there is some real evidence here. Uh, the important point in both of these icons, I'll mention them together, is that a very heavy dose of philosophy is laid onto the evidence in each case, mainly to persuade students that evolution is without direction or purpose. 
In the case of the ape to human icon, students are also told that humans, in effect, are nothing more than animals. Neither one of those claims comes from the evidence. Both of those are philosophical claims, but they use the evidence to make themselves appear more scientific than they really are. And so that's my criticism of those two icons. Now, are you a creationist because you argue about whether evolution took place? Well, I'd be curious as to why you're arguing about this. I don't know anybody who argues against whether evolution took place, except for those who have religious reasons for it. Well, all criticism of Darwinian evolution is certainly not based on religion. The science journals right across the di subdisciplines of biology are full of criticisms of the Darwinian approach to the history of life. The Darwinian mechanism is held by many evolutionists uh, to be insufficient to produce the, the new form and function in, in the history of life. Uh, many evolutionary biologists will hold to some form of evolutionary change in the history of life, but very flatly say natural selection is simply not a sufficient mechanism. One reason Charles Darwin was such a brilliant scientist is he was a great questioner. He didn't just accept the answers that people gave him at the time he lived. He kept looking at the evidence to come up with answers that he was satisfied with. How ironic it is today that people who support Darwin's theory are using it to close off questioning. If the scientific community back in Darwin's time adopted the attitude that many Darwinists adopt today, Darwin's theory would never would have seen the light of day. Students would never have been able to hear about it. Science progresses by allowing criticism, by allowing people to hear alternate points of view. We don't serve the cause of science. We certainly don't serve the cause of education by allowing people to present only one point of view about Darwin in the classroom. Do we really want to raise up scientists who are afraid to question reigning scientific theories? How do you think we've gotten any progress in science at all without people being willing to challenge existing theories? I think the most important reason to question and criticize Darwinian evolution is to make science better. The issue here is how to do good science. By that I mean theory, evidence, checking one against the other, and being willing to abandon the theory when it doesn't fit the evidence. That to me is science. It's ultimately truth-seeking. Darwinism to me is ideology, indoctrination. It's theory at all costs.